I've treated hundreds of patients and trained thousands of healthcare professionals over my 15 year career. And one thing I've learned through that experience is that most people are really confused about supplements or they lack a clear strategy or plan for how to use supplements to improve their health. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line designed to add back in what the modern world has squeezed out and help you feel and perform your best. Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients we need for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. I formulated Adapt Naturals using the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research to fill the nutrient gaps that we face today and replicate the nutrient intakes found in an optimal ancestral diet. Our flagship offering is called the Core Plus Bundle, a daily stack of five products that gives you everything you need each day, from essential vitamins and minerals like B12, folate, magnesium, and vitamin D, to phytonutrients like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, and beta-glucans. You can also order the products in the bundle separately if that works better for your needs. The Adapt Naturals products are made from the highest quality, food-based, or bioidentical ingredients, from cellular and immune health, to brain and nervous system support, to blood sugar and heart health, we've got you covered. Your supplement cupboard is about to get a lot smaller. We also created an app called Core Reset to help you get your nutrition, sleep, movement, and stress management dialed in. Because no matter how good our supplements are, and they are really good, you can't supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. The best part is that you get this app at no additional cost when you order the Core Plus bundle. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. Back in 2021, uh, which is still pretty early in the pandemic, I started seeing some really interesting studies come out on the role of the microbiome in COVID-19 infection. And the early research suggested that a disrupted gut microbiome may be a predisposing factor to acquiring the SARS coronavirus 2 pathogen, and it might also affect the course of the illness. And then there were also some interesting studies suggesting that one of the impacts of the virus itself was to disrupt the microbiome and that that impact could persist for weeks or in some cases possibly even months after the infection was cleared. So this wasn't really talked about in the mainstream media, but uh, I discussed it a little bit on my podcast and in some emails and articles. And it turns out there's since then been a really robust literature on this topic, looking at how the microbiome protects us against viral infections like SARS-CoV-2, but many other infections as well. And then how we can support our gut microbiome as a means to upgrade our immune defense. And I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Robin Chutkin as a guest to discuss this topic. She's recently written a book about it called The Antiviral Gut. And Dr. Chutkin is one of the most recognizable gastroenterologists working in the U.S. today. She has a bachelor's in science from Yale and an MD from Columbia and is a faculty member at Georgetown University Hospital and the founder of the Digestive Center for Wellness. So she has a great pedigree in conventional medicine as a conventionally trained gastroenterologist, but she also very early in her career recognized the limitations of a conventional approach to gastroenterology and started to branch out and really learn more about uh, uh, the function of the gut and the many different ways that the gut impacts our health and wellness and became interested in the antiviral capacity of the gut uh, most re recently during the pandemic. So she's a wealth of knowledge on this topic, um, has a lot of experience as a gastroenterologist and as a researcher and expert in the gut immune defense capacity. So I really enjoyed this conversation and I learned a lot. And I think you will, particularly if you're looking for ways to enhance your immunity and protect yourself against uh, COVID-19 and other viral pathogens. 
Okay, so without further delay, let's dive in. Robin, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So you know, you're a gastroenterologist. Uh, you've been looking at gut health for many, many years. And I'm just curious, you know, you, you're, you're, you're a gastroenterologist, but you're outside of the realm of purely conventional gastroenterology at this point. So what led you down the functional or integrative medicine path and led you to uh, seek answers outside of what your traditional training might, ha might have taught you? Chris, that's such a polite way of saying, how come you're a gastroenterologist and you're interested in more than doing colonoscopy <laughs> on people? So, I didn't say uh, that, so thank you said you for it. For <laughs> couching it in such polite terms, exactly. Now I'm taking the words right out of your mouth. You know, I, as you said, I'm conventionally trained. I went to med school at Columbia, did my residency there and was chief resident for a year there. Then I did my GI training down the street in New York, also at Mount Sinai Hospital, which has a really strong tradition of treating patients with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Dr. Crohn and colleagues first described Crohn's disease there in 1932. But for me, it was really a personal shift. So I came to Washington, D.C. in 1997, joined the faculty at Georgetown Hospital, and was, you know, practicing pretty conventional gastroenterology, doing a lot of colonoscopy, upper endoscopy, prescribing a lot of medications. and. Um, by virtue of the odd fact that in 1997, when I joined the faculty at Georgetown, they'd never had a woman on the faculty. And uh, gastroenterology is still, in terms of the patient population, very female predominant, and in terms of the doctors, very male predominant. So um, I was the only one on the faculty. We had a lot of patients in the GI clinic, and many of them wanted to see a woman. And there's a, you know, there's a strong desire for gender concordant physicians in some of the subspecialties in urology. A lot of men want to see a male urologist in gynecology. A lot of people want to see a female gynecologist. And so it turned out in gastroenterology, there was also a strong desire. So I started seeing a lot of these women and many of them wanted to know what else they could do besides the medications that were prescribed, et cetera. And now I'm not trying to say that this is something unique to women. Men are also curious and inquisitive about what they can do about their health. But in my clinic, my area of expertise, if you will, was autoimmune diseases in the gut, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis, which together make up inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. And the medications we have for IBD are, are pretty rough. You know, we have steroids, we have biologics, and those drugs can be really effective, but they have some really undesirable side effects. They either suppress or change your immune system. And in so doing, they can cause cancer. They can cause serious infection. So people, not just women, but people are really interested in alternatives. So they had questions and I didn't really have answers, Chris. I, you know, was conventionally trained and I didn't know much outside of a, a pharmaceutical cure, if you will. But I went in search of answers and I remember trying, you know, this is a late nineties. I remember trying like every diet out there going on Adkins and South beach and the specific carbohydrate diet and all these different, different sort of regimens and, um, researching stuff that I hadn't been taught in my medical training. I'd been taught how to identify what something is. So this is Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis versus diverticulosis but there hadn't been much attention to the why. Well, why does this person have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or diverticulosis? And you know what can they do to sort of reverse engineer this disease into remission? And so I embarked on really a, a journey that I think is still continuing. And then that journey became really personal about 18 years ago when my daughter was born. I was a healthy person having my first child. And I had the flu at the time of uh, when I went into labor. And because I had the flu, they decided to give me prophylactic antibiotics just in case. Uh -oh. And that just in case piece never turns out to be a good idea. At the time, I, I had no idea, right? I really hadn't made the connection between antibiotics, disruption to the gut microbiome and problems down the road as many of us in the medical community had not, and many still haven't, unfortunately. So I got these antibiotics during labor. I ended up with a C-section. Another thing, I had no awareness of the incredible differences for the baby in whether they're born vaginally and they have the opportunity to travel through that birth canal, swallowing a mouthful of microbes and colonizing their microbiome with those founding species 
versus babies who are born via C-section, you know, slash and pulled out of the uterus, they don't have that colonization. And instead of having those important founding species, the mother's bifidobacteria, et cetera, they're colonized with hospital acquired staph, staphylococcus, which I don't think you have to be a gastroenterologist or a microbiologist to know that hospital acquired staph doesn't, doesn't sound like what you want for your founding species. So my daughter was born by C-section, missed out on that important first step colonization. She received uh, potent intravenous antibiotics at birth, just in case. And that embarked her and our whole family on a journey that would last quite a few years of real sickliness. Um, She constantly had pharyngitis, you know, throat infection, strep, air infections. She ended up being prescribed more than 20 rounds of antibiotics before she was two. And, you know, it seemed, Chris, she was always either about to get sick, actually sick, or recovering from being sick. And I was a first-time mom. So even though I was a doctor and I received great medical training, I I just wasn't connecting the dots. And I remember asking friends who had babies saying, well, like how many rounds of antibiotics has your kid been on? And they're like, none. (laughs) You know, it just was so, um, it was so abnormal, but I really didn't know any better. And it wasn't until she was almost three, she had yet another illness. She had a chronic cough, sort of a post-infectious bronchitis that was more inflammatory, but My husband insisted on taking her back to the doctor. At this point, I had boycotted. I said, yeah, I'm not going. And they walked in. She's, I'll never forget, she's carrying this nebulizer machine for asthma with stickers, of course, on it. And my husband had four prescriptions. He handed me four prescriptions. He handed me a prescription for an antibiotic, an antihistamine, a bronchodilator, and a steroid. And that really, you know, it was such a pivotal moment for me personally, as a mom, as well as professionally to say, like, we are going down the wrong path. We need to veer off this path and move in a new direction. And that new direction for my daughter and our family involved being aware that many, if not most of the illnesses she was suffering from were actually viral. So antibiotics weren't of any efficacy and were only disrupting her microbiome. And also just waiting it out a lot of the time. And I'm always quick to point out here that I'm a physician. So I had some additional knowledge and expertise that made it safe for me to decide, okay, we're not going to the doctor. We're going to watch this illness. We're not going to treat. But I always recommend that people do this in conjunction with their healthcare provider. And so we, we really just stopped giving our antibiotics every month. And lo and behold, she got better. You know, she, we changed her diet. We took her off dairy. We took her off wheat and, um, she really, she started to perk up and it took a while, you know, it took, it took a year or two and she'd still get sick, but instead of getting strep and being, you know, out for the count for three weeks, it was now, okay, she's sick for five or six days and just gradually got out of that cycle of perpetual illness. And, and for me, it was an important change in direction because on the other end, on the professional end, I was treating patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis who had that same history Sydney had. C-section babies, lots of antibiotics in childhood, minimal breastfeeding, because of course my breast milk dried up quickly. And we know that there are important ingredients in breast milk called human milk oligosaccharides that aren't there to feed the baby, they're there to feed the baby's burgeoning microbial army. And so without that breast milk coming in the human milk oligosaccharides, the baby's microbiome is even further disrupted. And so I was seeing patients who, you know, now were in their teens and twenties and thirties and had pretty severe autoimmune diseases with that very similar history. So I had that inside knowledge to know that you know, this was potentially not going to lead to a good outcome. So for me, Chris, that was really, you know, that journey of sort of experimenting with myself, learning from patients who were doing things differently, who were sort of doing additional things in addition to conventional things with diet and mindfulness, meditation, et cetera, as well as that experience with Sydney really caused me to change the way I practice medicine and really caused me to look for some of these integrative solutions to look sort of beyond the scope, if you will, for a little bit of a GI analogy. That's a great segue, I think, into 
the main topic of this show, uh, which relates to your book, The Antiviral Gut, and the connection between the gut, the microbiome in particular, and our immune defense against viral pathogens. You just described how looking at the gut holistically, how much of a difference that made for your daughter's health and, and then for the patients that you were treating and understanding that the gut doesn't just exist in isolation from the rest of the body. Uh, and problems in the gut are, of course, not just limited to gastrointestinal symptoms and manifestations like IBD or IBS or uh, diverticulosis or diverticulitis, but that the consequences of a disrupted gut microbiome are almost shockingly diverse and can really affect every system and tissue in the body. Um, and, and research has shown us this over and over. So let's, let's rewind a little bit. Back in 2022, I remember seeing some initial studies published. Uh, these weren't surprising to me, but it was good to see that researchers were already doing this work. Uh, one paper was alterations in microbiota of patients with COVID-19, potential mechanisms and therapeutic interventions. And there were some very similar papers that were looking at this from two angles, like how does a disrupted gut microbiome predispose us to getting a viral infection in the first place or any other kind of infection? And then what is the effect that infections can have on the gut microbiome and, and you know, what, what can we do about both of those things? So I'm really curious just to, to hear ag again how you got interested in the connection between the microbiome and viral defense. Yeah, so Chris, I just wanna say before we even get into this that you and I were chatting before we started recording about, you know, when we first met almost 10 years ago at the first Mind Body Green Revitalize live conference at Miraval and you know how exciting it was to sort of meet people in person who I'm still in touch with like you and Joe Cross and Whitney and Danielle from Sakara and I have to say that even before that when I started you know well over a decade ago when I started down this journey and like investigating this stuff your name would pop up a lot in the literature and I remember reading an article you'd written it was something to do with the gut brain connection. And I remember thinking, who is this guy? Like, he's not a physician, but he knows so much. He knows more than my physician colleagues. Like, you know, being so intrigued and as a physician, like, you know, this might sound, you know, almost obnoxious, but a thinking like, how come like he knows so much and he's not a doctor. And it really opened my mind to the idea that, yeah, you know, the medical community doesn't necessarily have all the answers, right? I mean, we have we contribute a lot and we, you know, there's important information, but there's information to be found outside those walls, outside your doctor's office, et cetera. And, and you were one of the early people bringing that information forward. So I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. And, and thank now you. <laughs> let me answer your question. So in terms of predisposition, you're absolutely right about those articles. I mean, there was there have been quite a few studies, but there was one in 2021 from UMass Medical School that showed that the composition of the microbiome was the most important predictor of outcome from COVID. It was more important than age, gender, comorbidities like heart disease and hypertension and even lung disease, things that we were paying a lot of attention to. And to drill down a little bit into what they found, they found that people who had high levels of a bacteria called Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, or F. prosnitzii, for those of us who are on a first name basis for this bacterium, high levels of F. prosnitzii were associated with good outcomes. Those patients were much less likely to end up on a ventilator, to have acute respiratory distress syndrome, and to die. Conversely, high levels of a bacteria called Enterococcus faecalis, E. faecalis, different from F. prosnitzii. Um, so Enterococcus faecalis, high levels of that bacteria were associated with worse outcomes. And we know Enterococcus faecalis is associated with, it's not just bad outcomes in COVID, post-op infections, et cetera. Enterococcus faecalis seems to be able to penetrate the gut lining and get access to the bloodstream and, and internal parts of the body and wreak havoc. But more importantly than what the individual bacteria can do, it's the association and the company they keep. So we know that F. prosnitzii is the most prevalent bacteria in people who eat a lot of plants. 
not necessarily vegans. You and I both know plenty of vegans who don't eat that many plants and plenty of omnivores who eat lots of plants. So it is much more related to the amount of plants you're eating than to what name you apply to yourself. But people who eat lots of plants have high levels of F. prosnitziae. And F. prosnitziae isn't just protective against COVID. It is protective against colon cancer, against metabolic syndrome, diabetes, et cetera. And so really what the study was telling us was that the microbiome of people who eat a certain way has more of these certain organisms and can be more protective. And we also know that F. prosnitziae and other similar organisms take plant fiber and ferment it and create something called short-chain fatty acids, which I know many of your listeners know all about short-chain fatty acids, butyric acid, propionic acid, et cetera. Short-chain fatty acids help maintain the gut lining, the health of the gut lining, keeping it intact and preventing stuff from penetrating through. But short-chain fatty acids also modulate the immune system. They guide the immune system. And this is a really important point because for most people, who succumb to COVID, who end up with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, the cytokine storm we've heard so much about over the last few years. It's not a direct result of the virus itself. It's the immune response to it. It's an overblown immune response where your immune system responds too aggressively. And in the process of trying to clear the virus, it destroys normal tissue. In the case of ARDS, it's destroying healthy lung tissue along with the virus. So that's an overblown re- immune response. On the other hand, you don't want to have an underactive immune response where it's not strong enough to clear the virus. So as I'm fond of saying, you want to have that Goldilocks immune response just right. And in order to have that Goldilocks immune response, you need to have lots of short chain fatty acids. In order to have lots of short chain fatty acids, you need to have lots of F. prosnitzii. In order to have lots of F. prosnitzii, you need to eat a lot of plants, you need to have a high fiber diet. So this is how it's all connected. So really what that UMass medical school study was telling us and several others like it that came out of you know China and other parts of the world is that at the end of the day, how we live, what we eat, et cetera. And of course, it's a lot more than just diet, which hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about. But diet is a pretty significant factor that informs what's going on in our gut microbiome and what's going on in our gut microbiome informs our overall health and particularly our immune health. And remember that those microbes are separated from all those immune processes by a single layer of cells, just one cell thick, and they're constantly interacting. So if your gut microbiome is disrupted you are going to end up with a disrupted immune response and possibly an overblown immune response because it's not modulated, it's not guided properly and potentially a poor outcome. So, you know, that's one of the direct effects. We know that there are other things the gut does, stomach acid that unravels and denatures viral proteins can protect us from infection. We have a study from 2020 53,000 people population-based study that showed that people taking those potent acid blocking drugs, proton pump inhibitors, are two to four times more likely to end up with COVID. And this isn't new. We know that that's true of rotavirus and other viral illnesses for people taking these drugs. So Christina, one of the main goals in writing this book was to open people's eyes a little bit to the idea of the gut as a defensive organ. You know, everybody knows the gut is a digestive organ, but I I don't think people really think of the gut as a defensive organ, as an organ system that can keep you safe from viruses and other pathogens. So that was really the challenge with this book was to explain to people like all the different things the gut does, stomach acid, the gut lining, the microbiome, all the different ways that it is keeping you safe and to really promote this idea that you can be a healthier host and healthier hosts have better outcomes. You have less susceptibility and you have better outcomes if you do get infected. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. 
It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy to use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash Element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. I've been writing and speaking about the harms of industrial seed oils for years. They're an enormous problem. They've been linked to widespread health and environmental issues, and yet they're in almost everything we eat. Zero Acre is here to change that. Their cultured oil is an all-purpose cooking oil with over 90% heart-healthy and heat-stable monounsaturated fats. In fact, it has more monounsaturated fat than even olive and avocado oil, and it has a much higher smoke point and a clean, neutral taste, which makes it perfect for everything from cooking and baking to salad dressings. I use it to cook my eggs in the morning, uh, ground beef, uh, pretty much anything that I'm going to cook that might have a higher smoke point and that I don't want the oil to have an impact on the taste of the food. It's become one of my favorite cooking oils. And since it's made by fermentation, it has a 10 times smaller environmental footprint than other vegetable oils. I'm a huge fan of this product. I think you'll love it as well. And Zero Acre is offering our listeners free shipping on their first order. So go to zeroacre.com slash chris or use the code chris at checkout to claim this deal. That's z-e-r-o-a-c-r-e dot com slash chris. One of the things I like to remind people of is that the contents of the gut, what's inside of the gut, are actually outside of the body. Uh, the gut being a hollow tube intersects the mouth and the anus, and we, we mostly think of what's inside the gut as being inside of our body, but it's not inside of our body until it gets absorbed across the lumen of the intestine into the bloodstream, and that, that's one of the many ways that the gut protects us is, is discerning what gets in and what gets out when it's functioning optimally. But what are some of the other ways that the gut protects us? I mean, you just listed a couple, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the GALT and the percentage of the immune system that we think resides in, in that tissue and, and just the role that the gut plays in the immune system in general. Sure. And Chris, I'm so glad you mentioned the inside out thing. I, I wager that most of my GI colleagues have never thought about that and are not aware of that when you, you know, what you just said. So I'm going to, I'm going to say it again for people to absorb this. What is in your gut is not inside your body. It's in a hollow, you know, digestive superhighway, a tunnel that goes from your mouth to your anus. And the purpose of the gut lining is to keep a lot of what is in your gut lumen, namely outside your body, is to keep it outside. So that could be, you know, things like pollen and things that you swallow from the environment. It could be viruses, bacteria that you're exposed to. It could be poorly digested food particles. It could be toxins. So an intact gut lining is a selective barrier. It's selectively permeable, and it's only going to let things of a certain size and things that it's vetted. It's like the bouncer, you know, at the club. It's like, yeah, no, you're not coming in. You're, you're a troublemaker. You're staying out here. Yeah, you can come in. And so it's a selective, and it's not just size. It's not just the pore size of the membrane. There are other things too that, the, that determine uh, what can get in. And so it's a very selective barrier. And when we damage that barrier, kind of like a fishing net, if we make big, huge holes in the net, now all sorts of stuff that shouldn't be able to penetrate through that gut lining and gain access to the inside of your body through that membrane can get in. And so, for example, if we look at something like food sensitivities and food allergies, we see improperly digested food particles getting through and triggering some sort of reaction in the body is a common one. And we know that a lot of that is associated with the damaged gut lining. When we look at MIS, multisystem inflammatory syndrome, and MIS-C in children, and we can see it in adults. So this, again, the sort of multisystem inflammatory syndrome that we've seen with COVID, we have really good data 
from Hijan Kim's lab in South Korea that a lot of people who suffer from MISC have a damaged gut lining. They have increased intestinal permeability, and that's how the virus is able to penetrate in. And we see high levels of a protein called zonulin, which is associated with an increased intestinal permeability. High levels of zonulin, we see the virus, you know, getting into the bloodstream. And uh, that is one of the mechanisms. It's probably not the only mechanism, but one of the mechanisms when we scratch our head and we say, okay, why does this person have MIS? Um, a lot of it has to do with this damage to the intestinal lining. So again, the gut lining, it's only one cell thick, people. That's not very thick. That's razor, razor thin. And so you think about the things that you do, maybe even on a daily basis that damage that gut lining. And top of the list is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, you know, as we're, as we're reaching for that ibuprofen, you really have to think, okay, what am I doing to the gut lining? Uh, alcohol, stress can do it. Things that sometimes we have less control over radiation, et cetera. You know, if you've had malignancy and you've had some sort of radiation to the body that can damage your gut lining, uh, infections, fungal infections, et cetera, can do it. Uh, food can do it. Lots of artificial sweeteners, um, highly processed foods, a lot of the emulsifiers and things they use in ultra processed foods are damaging to the gut lining. And that's why we're seeing an association with Crohn's disease and other gut based disorders as a result of, of eating lots of ultra processed foods. And of course, you know, the medicine cabinet. So in addition to ibuprofen, antibiotics also problematic there. So in terms of how the gut protects you, having an intact lining literally keeps bad players like SARS-CoV-2 out of your body, keeps them in, in the gut lining where they can pass through and be excreted. And we know we do excrete SARS-CoV-2 and we can see the viral shedding in the stool long after a nasal swab is negative. So some of that elimination continues even after we can detect it in the, in the nasal swab. We talked about stomach acid and that's another potent way our gut defends us. It literally, you know, acidifies that, that, that acid literally denatures a viral protein and, um, makes it so that the virus is inactive. And we know that the gut is a common portal of entry for SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses, poliovirus to lots of other RNA viruses. We have about a hundred times more ACE2 inhibitor receptors that receptor for SARS-CoV-2, ACE2 receptors uh, in the gut compared to the lungs. And so um, we know that when the virus gets in through the gut, it can bind to intestinal cells and enter the body that way. But if you have intact stomach acid, that's less likely to happen. So when we look at a population of people and we say, okay, all of these people were exposed, but how come only these people got sick and these people didn't get sick? So there are things like extremes of age, the young where the microbiome is just forming and the elderly where the microbiome is sort of waning. There is whether somebody's on a immunosuppressive drug or not, there's comorbidities, et cetera. But we know that some of these gut-based defenses are really critical. Is your gut lining intact? Do you have adequate levels of stomach acid? Do you have a healthy, diverse microbiome or has your microbiome been disrupted by antibiotics, acid blocking drugs, poor diet, et cetera? Um, these are some of the things. Mucus, we didn't even talk about mucus. And I'll tell you, when I was in medical school, I did not like mucus. I thought mucus was kind of gross. And so I liked critical care medicine. I loved being in the ICU. But the pathway to being a critical care doctor, what they call an intensivist, where you work in the intensive care unit, is primarily through doing a fellowship in pulmonary medicine. And I was like, oh man, no way am I dealing with snot. And when you consider that I ended up a gastroenterologist, it's like, okay, but you deal with stool. But I got to tell you, Chris, stool is a lot less gross than snot. Snot. <laughs> I'll take stool over snot any day. It turns out though, that snot and mucus is really important too. So people think when they think mucus, you think the lungs, but the truth is most of the mucus is made in your gut about a liter and a half a day. And mucus is this weird mix of like jello and glue. So it's a sticky matrix and it traps things. It traps things like pollen and other irritants. It traps viruses, but it doesn't just trap them. It also neutralizes them through releasing enzymes. So it's like, you know, I'm going to trap SARS-CoV-2 and then I'm going to secrete these enzymes to destroy, to again, like the stomach acid, to denature the viral protein. 
And then the cilia in the lungs, those little hair-like projections are going to move the mucus up and then you're going to spit it out or you're going to swallow it where it will be excreted in the gut. So mucus is really a key part of, again, this gut defensive system. And, um, you know, it's also a lubricant, right? So it lines all these hollow organs like our vagina, our GI tract, our nose, our mouth, et cetera. But, but mucus also has a really important defensive role. And so we know people who don't have healthy mucus, who are smokers, who are dehydrated, et cetera, um, where their mucus isn't as healthy, they are not able to degrade the virus as well. And so when we look at this sort of super spreading, we know that for many viral illnesses, for measles, for Ebola, and for SARS-CoV-2, it's a small percentage of people, less than 10%, who are responsible for more than 90% of the infections. There's some people where, you know, we've seen super spreader events from the Rose Garden at the White House to that early one, the Coral Group in Washington, in Seattle, Washington, where, you know, I, I think for that one, they were like 57 out of 65 people were infected or something, which is much higher than you would expect. And it turns out that the person who the sort of incident case was a super spreader. So part of how we think super spreaders work is that there's something different about their mucus where their mucus is not destroying the virus as it should. And so if you get sneezed on or coughed on by a super spreader, you're much more likely to become infected than by somebody whose healthy mucus has killed the virus. So, you know, these are some of the things I think that we don't really think about. We don't think about these differences in host susceptibility and how they can affect not just us, but the people around us in terms of how these things are transmitted. And so we have a real opportunity, I think, with this pandemic and with the, all the others that are coming down the pike to really think about these things and to both collectively as a society and individually think about how we can become healthier hosts so that we can be more resilient. Absolutely. And I think that's such a shift in, in the dominant paradigm, the, the conventional paradigm that we grew up in was really mostly about disease management, right? Most people go to the doctor when there's a problem and they ask the doctor to help them fix the problem. Fair enough. There's a need for that. There will always be a need for that. But there's very little focus in our conventional medical system on prevention and on the thing, all the things that we can do to prevent a problem from happening in the first place. And I don't care what context you're talking about, whether it's running a business, health, environmental concerns. Uh, ben Franklin was, was right when he said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think that's especially true perhaps with gut health. Um, as you've mentioned in several different contexts now, how we treat our gut from what we eat to the personal care products we use to our exposure to toxins in the external environment, to how we manage stress, to how much sleep we get, uh, what, what medications we take or don't take and their impact on the gut flora, like ibuprofen, NSAIDs, e even hormonal contraception has been shown to affect the gut in, in various ways. It's a mindset shift, right, for, for to getting from just waiting until something bad happens to really you know, more of like gardening kind of analogy, like nur nurturing the soil uh, so that good things can happen in that garden of the gut rather than just being reactive. Absolutely. I love the, the soil analogy. And, you know, when you think about the whole concept of terrain theory, so Louis Pasteur popularized this idea of germ theory that says, you know, a bad bug gets into your system and it makes you sick. And that's certainly true. Ebola, SARS-CoV-2, these are these are organisms that shouldn't be in our body. And when they get in, they can create illness. But another Frenchman, uh, Antoine Béchamp, championed terrain theory at around the same time. And he said, if your terrain, if your soil is healthy, the seed, the pathogen can pass pretty harmlessly through your system with minimal disruption. And that, you know, we see that all the time. And people and I don't know, Chris, whether how much of this was because of the media sort of on both sides, right? Liberal and conservative. There was so much, maybe not intentional, but sort of just fair that they were instilling in people. And I don't know if it's partly because of the media 
or maybe because this was a novel virus, but if you think just rationally for a moment about illness in general, if you think about heart disease, if a 35 year old healthy person has a heart attack, they are much more likely to survive that than if a 70 year old smoker who's hypertensive has obesity, eats a terrible diet and is sedentary, has a heart attack, right? And the same is true for cancer, a broken leg, whatever it is. If we are healthier hosts, we are much more likely to survive whatever illness comes our way. We're much less likely to get the illness in the first place. <laughs> That's the first thing. And we're much more likely to have a better outcome than somebody. And some of the things we can't control, we can't control age. There is some genetic predisposition, but by far, most of this is a result of how we live. It's a result of things we have control over. And one of my biggest complaints about the medical industrial complex is that it wants to make you feel helpless. It wants to make you feel like the only thing you can do is take an antiviral or get a vaccine. And those are all reasonable things to do, but there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do that are going to have a significant impact on whether you get infected. And if you do get infected, because there is a little bit of inevitability to this exposure, but whether you end up asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, or very ill, and maybe even leaving the hospital horizontally, God forbid. So that is, you know, that is really the message. And I think because, in fact, I know, because so much of what happens in medicine, there is commerce at the root of it, right? And particularly with the pharmaceutical companies, it, it's not a message that is propagated within the medical community for the most part. You know, what's propagated within the medical community for the most part is pharmaceuticals and more pharmaceuticals. And, you know, there's not much you can do. And that's true whether we're talking about viral illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, anything else. It is, you know, this is what's going on and here is a drug to treat it. And again, like those drugs can be life-saving. They can be critically important, but there's a lot of additional stuff that you can do that's going to, you know, improve your outcome when you bump up against things like SARS-CoV-2 or heart disease or cancer or anything else. And, and again, you know, part of, of why I love the work that you do is, is very much about empowering the individual and, you know, you're a lot stronger than you think and here, are, you know, 16 things that you can do to improve your health. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, some of the research I had seen suggested that SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses as well. Like we don't need to make this just about that. It's the the one that most people are thinking about now, but this is true for other viruses. Not only does having a disrupted microbiome and poor gut health increase our the likelihood of us getting the infection, we've seen studies that show that the infection can disrupt the microbiome and that disruption can persist for some period of time after being infected and there's some speculation although i think this is i mean i think this is reasonable based on what we understand about the connection between gut and and well-being but there's speculation that uh disrupted gut microbiome caused by the sars cov2 sars cov2 virus could actually be at least in part driving some of the phenomenon known as long covid uh for some people in some situations so i know in your You've helped a lot of patients recover from COVID. You talk about this in your book. What do you think about this, like the ongoing impact or the, the impact of the virus on the gut and how people can tend to their gut health as a means of, of recovering if they're dealing with persistent symptoms? You're absolutely right about the microbiome disruption. So, you know, the general term dysbiosis that we use for a disrupted microbiome. Dysbiosis is both a risk factor for worse outcome and a potential result of infection. So when SARS-CoV-2 binds to those ACE2 receptors, ACE2 receptors control, not completely, but have some impact on gut diversity. So that binding process can induce changes in the microbiome that create a more imbalanced, disrupted microbiome, what we generally refer to as dysbiosis. At the same time, people who have a dysbiotic gut, a disrupted microbiome, are more likely to get sick in the first place. So it's both cause and effect. And you're also 
correct in pointing out that dysbiosis, whether you had it before you got infected or you had it as a result of the infection, dysbiosis itself is associated with post-viral syndromes like long COVID. And not just long COVID, if we look at uh, ME-CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, we also see a disrupted gut microbiome. We see a microbial signature with chronic fatigue syndrome where researchers at Cornell are able to identify people with ME-CFS just by looking at their gut microbiome. They can tell with a pretty high degree of accuracy. And we have similar studies in the gastroenterology literature where people with acute COVID were followed and the ones who developed long COVID, a high percentage in this study, had some typical microbial changes. So we know that there is something about the gut microbiome in people who are having these post-viral syndromes that is different. And so even if there are other things involved, you know, there's dysautonomia where the autonomic nervous system is involved, there's autoimmunity often going on, there are other things, but we know that really sort of, you know, doubling down on trying to improve the gut ecosystem can be a really successful way to help combat these, a lot of these symptoms. And, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen while your gut health improves, right? Even if your long COVID doesn't completely go away. But if we look at something like post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, it's uh, really a constellation of different signs and symptoms that can develop after infection in the gut. So after infection with Campylobacter, with amoebiasis, with a lot of different things, and even after infection with COVID, and lots of similarities to what millions of people are now experiencing, you know, with long COVID. And, um, you know, in addition to the disruption of the microbiome, we also see disruption of the intestinal barrier function, changes in intestinal permeability, what I was talking about with the MIS, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, et cetera. So, you know, we have to think about all of those gut defenses we talked about earlier. We have to think about what you can do to strengthen the gut lining, what you can do to repair your gut microbiome, what you can do to maintain stomach acid levels, all of these different things. So avoidance is a big part of this, Chris, you know, the, the medicine cabinet you got to make sure that everything you're taking, you're, you're taking for a good reason, right? And that the benefits outweigh the risks. There was a study published in the journal Nature in 2018, where they looked at 41 different classes of medications, and they found that half of them were disruptive to the gut microbiome. So not the obvious ones, like, I mean, of course, antibiotics, acid blockers, et cetera. There were certain laxatives. They were antidepressants. They were all kinds of medications. They were beta blockers for the heart that were found to be disruptive to the gut microbiome. So, you know, high, high up on my list is judicious use of medication to make sure that you're not, because this idea that, you know, you can just take a probiotic and all as well is a little bit of magical thinking. So when I think about my approach to somebody who's struggling with post-COVID symptoms, I think about removing medications, practices, and foods that are damaging to their microbiome. So we talked about some of the medications, other practices, they might be under a lot of stress that they're not, they don't have a good strategy for handling the stress. They may not be sleeping well. They may not be getting enough exposure to the outdoors in terms of food. They may be eating a ultra processed diet, high in sugar. So some of those things that we know are damaging to the microbiome. I think about replacing missing or depleted gut bacteria. And that's much more about exposure to soil microbes and ferments fermented foods and prebiotic foods than it is taking a probiotic pill. So maybe eating some sauerkraut, um, you know, making sure you're getting a lot of these prebiotic foods, whether it's oats, legumes, greens, however you're getting them. I tend to get them through beans and greens, but there are lots of other ways. And then, you know, some of these scientifically backed mind body practices that we know are really helpful. Like you know, stress and sleep deprivation right there. We have a study from the British Medical Journal that showed there's an 88% increased risk of COVID in people who are chronically sleep deprived. We know that vaccine efficacy is profoundly affected by sleep deprivation. If you are sleep deprived in the two days prior to receiving a vaccine, the efficacy can be decreased by as much as 50%. So sleep reboots that sort of immune computer in your body. And if you're sleep deprived, you literally cannot recruit enough T cells 
to have a proper immune response to get to that Goldilocks immune response, right? And you're going to be, you're going to have an underactive immune response. So, you know, I always remind people what they think is in their head is also in their body. And uh, in the book, I have, gosh, I think I have 24 sections of solutions for how to get a good night's sleep. I really, I really went down a rabbit hole with sleep because it, it is such, it has such a profound effect on our viral susceptibility and the same for stress. You know, we have, there's a study, there's a remarkable study from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, looking at men with HIV. And they found that men who did not have strategies for mitigating stress, not, not, not men without stress, men who didn't have a strategy, whether it was exercise or mindfulness or whatever it is, men with HIV who did not have any sort of stress management strategies, their HIV progressed to AIDS four times faster. It's crazy, uh-huh. right? But but then it's not crazy when we think about it, because if we look at other viral illnesses like shingles, so that is, you know, varicella, the virus that causes chicken pox, it's latent in the body, and then it it becomes active again as shingles in, in older age. Who gets shingles? People who are stressed. You don't get shingles on vacation. You get shingles, you know, while you're stressed out, something something stressful is happening, death of a loved one, stress at work, marital problems, et cetera. That's when you get shingles. So we see that stress is a potent, potent facilitator of viral illness, not just acute illness, but also chronic and latent viral illness. We know that the environment makes a huge difference, a Japanese practice of shinrin-yoku or forest bathing. So we know that that's good for stress, right? We've been studies in Japan that show a decrease in stress hormone production, that show improvements in the immune system, better recovery from illness. And we know there's something called the open air factor, the OAF. I think people are pretty aware at this point that viral transmission is less outdoors, right? So if there's a big bump in numbers, in terms of viral infections, you might move to start having functions outside because there's going to be less transmission outside compared to inside. But there's also better recovery. So we know from studies more than 100 years ago with the Spanish flu epidemic, 1914 to 1918, that soldiers who recovered outside in the fresh air had much lower mortality than people who were inside the hospital, in some cases, 13% mortality versus 40, 40%. Mortality, and that's because of this thing called the open air factor, the outdoor air factor, which is described as a germicidal constituent in open air that is, you know, somehow harmful to these viruses that can kill viruses. And um, and so these are the kinds of things when we when we think about how to approach this. You know, it's it's not okay. Here's a probiotic. It is all of these things. It is you've got to master your mind. You've got to focus on, you know, your sleep hygiene and your stress mitigation strategies. You've got to think about your environment and how can you get outside. You've got to be more thoughtful about therapeutics and and think of ways to tackle health challenges that don't destroy your precious gut microbes in the process, which involves, for example, knowing those critical questions to ask your doctor when you're sick and they're handing you a prescription for antibiotics, starting with, is this antibiotic absolutely necessary? What would happen if I didn't take it? Could this illness I'm suffering from get better on its own? I mean, it's shocking how much of the time the doctor's just handing you something because he or she thinks you want something and they think this is a viral illness and they know the antibiotics aren't going to work. So, you know, all of these things are, um, are really important. And of course, knowing how to feed your microbes, right? Making sure you're you're getting in adequate amounts of plant fiber, in addition to whatever else you're eating that can feed those uh, F prosnitzii so they can start churning out the short chain fatty acids. So it's really a very, it's a very broad approach. It focuses on these innate host defenses in our gut. But I think the, you know, the plan, which is a whole second half of the book, it pulls from a lot more of these areas too. And it does show, you know, what's the relationship of sleep to the gut, et cetera. But it is really challenging people to think more broadly about what gut health is and gut health isn't just what you eat or, you know, a probiotic you might take. Amazing. I love this conversation, Robin. I love your book. And I would love for you to let people know where they can find out more about it and pick up a copy. 
Oh, thank you so much, Chris. The book is called The Antiviral Gut, Tackling Pathogens from the Inside Out. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, wherever books are sold. And you can follow me on Instagram at gutbliss, G-U-T-B-L-I-S-S. I have a couple websites that are full of lots of great free information. One is just robinshotcan.com, my difficult to spell first name and last name, <laughs> R-O-B-Y-N-N-E. C-H-U-T-K-A-N.com or gutbliss.com. And we have, you know, we have, I think, 37 different topics in the free gut guide section, everything from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth to hemorrhoids. We have a great blog that you can search with lots of this stuff. And um, I also do a free office hours series on Instagram live every Tuesday at noon. And so you can go back and look at some of those archived ones. We have a YouTube channel everything's a little bit disorganized. <laughs> I'm trying to get things, we're overflowing with content. So I'm trying to bring a little uh, order to the chaos, but if you poke around, you'll find it all. And I'm hoping to reorganize our YouTube channel and have every all the video stuff there in another couple of weeks. There's a lot of great resources there. So thank you for sharing. And thank you everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Keep sending your questions to chriscruster.com slash podcast question. Robin, thank you for coming on. Congrats on the book. And I'm really glad that I'll be able to recommend this to people because I think it's such a foundational issue that a lot of people don't even consider when it comes to immune defense in general and defense against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and other viral pathogens specifically. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to, for our next conversation. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. And congrats to you on all the great work and the information you put out there. Okay, we'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks for listening. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.